Pedro from EMP Reacts. I'm here today with Neil from Devil Driver to talk about dealing with demons volume one out October 2nd on Napalm Records. I think I hit all the nails in the head there. That's it. That's why I'm here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for taking the time to sit down and talking about this record. And I want to start off with what was the driving force or the inspiration, if you will, behind this themed uh, slash concept record of yours? Hmm. Um, the, the driving force behind it, uh, I guess it, it all started with an idea that Des had. Uh, he wanted to do a double record. Uh, I think just in general in life, he wanted to do one. At the time, he was like, he really wanted to talk about, um, I mean, it's going to sound a, a little generic, but bondage, human suffering, these kind of things that are, you know, they're, they're all around metal music, but uh, more how this can turn it into rage and turn it into good things, positive aspects that can come out of this, uh, these, these dark feelings. And that, that's the general gist of the start of it. Um, and we just kind of rolled with it from there and ended up, you know, I think we recorded some, like 22 songs, whittled it down to the 19, nine, of, nine or 10 of which are on that first, the first side coming out on October 2nd. Does this add extra pressure for you guys, starting from the beginning, knowing, okay, we're going to do a, a double album? It's not like you end up with a lot of material, then afterwards decide to create the, the two records. You started from that, that starting point. Uh, was that right. extra pressure for you guys? Oh, uh, no, not really. Um, the, way, the way that we write, uh, Mike and Austin and I will get together and, uh, and throw around ideas, and then it eventually gets out to Des, and he writes on top of that. It's, that's the traditional Devil Driver way of writing. Um, and, I mean, as far as the, the music goes, I mean, Mike and I are always, we're constantly writing. If we're home, we're writing. So in between tours, we already had enough. I mean, I, I want to say that... Um, as, as far as rough ideas, general demos, we had, we had over 30 for sure um, at the start of this. So it's fortunately, it's never really a problem for us uh, as far as a lack of material that just doesn't really happen. Hopefully it continues that way. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it hard for you guys to narrow down the songs that you wanted considering, you know, like, like you said, material is never lacking. Uh, was it hard to get down to the ones that you felt that were the ones that needed to be on these two on these two volumes, but more so in this first volume? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that becomes the harder point. Yes, yeah, de deciding which which of all your babies is the best baby, you know. Um, and we're we're all we'll all tell you that we're terrible about that. Like we're not we're not good at being that um, objective outsider. So it's I like listening to the label. I like listening to management. Uh, I like listening to my wife. What's good? What's not? Because to me, it's all it's all good. I wouldn't I wouldn't have put it out there if I didn't think it was worthy. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that can get tough for sure. And, and when you're involved with the process, I'm assuming sometimes it's hard to see the forest from the trees. Yeah. Because you've been working totally. on all of these songs for a while, and and after a long time, it's like, well, they all sound capable of being in the record. Like, how do I pick? Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. I mean. The, it, it's, the funny part about it, though, is that um, the, the very first single that we released off these, which Keep Away From Me, is it really stood out to me at the, at the end of, you know, we recording these 1920 songs. At the end of it, we were, I, that really stood out. I'm glad that that made it all, that it stood out to other people and it made it to be the first single of it. Because I think it's real, a real good um, representation of the record. I agree. Uh, where we're trying to go, what, what most of it's going to sound like. Um, that's a good indicator. And it just, it made sense to me as soon as I had the, you know, the finished product, I was like, yep, yeah, that's it. It's also perfect to have it as the opener on the album because it kind of gives yeah. you a glimpse of everything that you're going to get from a lyrical perspective, but also from a sound and vocal perspective for the rest of the album. So not only you guys pick the best, you know, the, perhaps the best single to release first, but also to start off the album with a song that's that strong. It's, it's a really winning formula. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I, I hope it. I hope it is again for us. It's a good formula. <laughs> uh, one of the elements that I have to ask you about the record is that you're you're dealing with different demons uh, throughout the album. So th there's there's a theme that permeates throughout the whole record, but it's not like you know a concept in the traditional way that you would ex you, uh, you would think of a concept that starts with a character in the first song and it kind of moves along. This is th this has a little f a different feel. How do you create ten songs? with 10 different topics in mind, but still allow the album to be one because it doesn't sound 
like the songs are broken. They, they all they all have great fluidity from one to the other. Um, thank, thanks for saying that. Um, it, it's a little difficult. The, the one thing that we had kind of working for us, uh, knowing that this was going to be, um, you know, roughly have, have a whole, as a whole be something instead of just the separate songs, we took little themes. You'll hear things here and there, like uh, the, the, I mean, the, the album name, Dealing With Demons, is in a couple of the songs. It's not because Des just ran out of words. It's because we wanted to keep it thematic, you know. Um, the this, this same thing uh, is is in the, the guitars. Like every once in a while, you'll hear a theme that's in one song, it's in another. And this is to kind of keep the cohesion, you know. Um, I Hopefully it's not as obvious as like, oh, well, that's the same pre-chorus as that song. I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, I know no, it's, it's not. not. Um, but it's, it's enough to keep, um, if anything, your subconscious connected to it. Be like, oh yeah, I heard this before in the second song. Now it's in the 10th. This makes sense. I, I feel the, the overture of it. Yeah. Yeah, because for me as a listener, I, I felt connected to the record from the first to the last song. And then by the right. time I got to the end of the album, I'm like, wow, like how they were able to glue them together? Because I, I, I didn't really notice those, those key points that transition from one to the other. I just felt that they were unique. Same thing as your fingers in your hand. But when you put them all together, you have your full hand, right? Like the yeah. it kind of works like that. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Then I guess we did, the, we did our job, at least with you. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> One down, millions more to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, from all the demons that you guys exercised with this first volume, which ones are closer to you? Mm, uh, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, not to get too deep with you here, there's uh, this track that we've already released called uh, Iona that's dealing with loss and and what that grief can do to you and stuff. And I, I guess loss, if we're talking about general demons in life, um, around the, uh, towards the end of the recording of this, I lost my, my dog that I had had for years and years. And anybody who really knows me knows that that dog's a, a part of me as much as any person. Um, so I, I was dealing with loss a lot. I guess I would say that's the one that, really you know stab the knife in for me yeah that resonates with you a little bit more yeah yeah you know I, I have to ask you obviously about the guitars i mean we're talking about devil driver i'm talking to you if we talked about everything else i didn't talk about the guitars i'm not really doing my job here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know i i felt like you guys had an amazing guitar sound throughout the album did you have a, an idea a, a a thought process and how you wanted this album to sound from a guitar perspective going in? Uh, yes. Yeah, we did. Uh, so the, the one difference between this record and any other Devil Driver record uh, concerning guitar tones is that we, we made a conscious effort to have, um, it's funny that I say conscious effort because I can't remember who's on which side as I say this, but Mike's on one side, I'm on the other side, and we both use different amps for different songs. If the song felt like it needed this a little crunchier, grindier amp, then we'd use that for me, and then we'd use whatever worked for Mike on that and switch them around. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's definitely partly uh, because of the producer, Steve Evitz. Um, he was kind of gearing us that way. But the last couple of records, we, you know, we just have one sound, and that's the, the rhythm sound of the whole record. And we have the one lead sound and that's how we go. And that's, that's how we kept the cohesion in the other ones. And this one, I didn't feel like it was necessary that way. I felt like it, we already had the, the themes that I, I had talked about previously. Um, we really wanted to try something new for us. You know, I'd done it before with other bands, but as far as Devil Driver, I've never done that before. Of having just one rhythm guitar on this side that's Mike, one rhythm guitar that's this side that's Neil and different amps, different tones. It worked really well. It, cre it created a, like you, you mentioned before, it created a grimier, crunchier sound, but a sound that it's not the necessarily the same sound on every single song. It changes yeah. with, it almost changes with the mood of the tracks. Do, do you feel it that way? A hundred percent. Yes, that's, that's what we were going for. Um, on some of like the, the slower, softer parts, we would use completely different, uh, you know, like more creamier top end type amps. Um, then when, when we're getting down to like the, the grime, like doing like those, those long tremolo pick parts and keep away from me, we use like our traditional tones, you know, like I would use a Soldano that I've been using touring with. 
uh, and then and Mike, I think Mike used a Bogner on that one, but yeah, just you know, just deadly tones on the parts that needed to be deadly, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, one thing that I thought that was more consistent was how you guys approached the solos. So there was this, this uh, at least in my mind, the way I, I listened to the record, I felt like you guys had a concerted effort in order to make the overall sound on the album from a guitarist perspective, very powerful, very thick, a lot of volume. But on yeah. the solos, I felt like they were a lot more driven, a lot more melodic. It kind of gave like this Jackal and Hyde feel from how the track sounded and then how the solo sounded. Do, do you see it that way or, or, or you have a different view on how the solos were put together for this record? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I tried uh more than ever which is uh i don't know is what it is but more than ever i tried to disturb the song i'm not there trying to prove that i can sweep for an hour i'm not trying to prove i feel like i've kind of done that or it comes to a show and i'll prove that i, I, I can do that all day like that's what the show is about partly but this was more about the song i wanted to serve the song if the song needed something um you know just sorrowful wailing instead of just a ripping part then i would do that and um, another part about that is uh, Steve and I, the, the producer again, have a lot of musical connections, things we like, and we, we were really geeking out on Brian May and Queen at the time. So a lot of my solo specifically, we try to use old vintage effects that Brian May used, some kind of nasally or like wah stuff to, that would really fit in the mix. When it sounds, when it's on its own, it might not sound like the thickest, fullest solo you've ever heard but at least sonically, it, it, it gives it a space apart from a typical metal solo. And we tried to use that idea on a lot of the, a lot of the solos. I, I love that you say that, because when I listened to the album, I got that impression. So at least it, Great. but I wasn't sure if, am I really hearing what I'm hearing? Because the, the solos <laughs> had a different sound to it, almost classical in, 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 yeah. a, certain, in a certain way. And I'm like, this is a Devil Driver album. Like maybe, maybe I'm overanalyzing. So I'm, I'm really happy that you're saying that because it makes me feel like I wasn't overanalyzing. I was just listening. No, no. It sounds like you got it right on the, you hit that nail on the head. It's, it's, it's a really incredible album from a solo's perspective because I really enjoy it. Every track has something to offer. This album from a guitar sound overall is really well put together. Very driven, great sound. But was there a song that gave you guys a little bit of gray hair when you were putting it together? <laughs> um, I don't have any hair, so for me it would be impossible. But <laughs> right, uh, I don't. Man, it was it was. I wish I had some crazy story for you, but it was honestly, especially for recording so many songs, it was so smooth. Uh, looking back, the process. Um, I want to say there there are. I can't, I can't even remember the song's names right now, but there are a cup. There are uh, one song each where Mike did all of his rhythms and then one song where I did all of my rhythms because we were both getting to the point. It was at the end of it. We were like, fuck, man, we got to learn another song. Like how? And I remember sitting there being like, Mike, what did you do? Like, what is this? Oh, man, fuck it. You do it. You know, and, and then the same thing happened with him. Um, I wish I could remember the exact tracks, but uh, I want to say they're both on the second the second side of the record anyway this hasn't been released so it's not not of great import right now but uh, for the most part it it no gray hairs were made because it was smooth it was really smooth that's good that's good i have to ask you about two songs on this album that were, i mean i really enjoy the record but these two for whatever you know there's sometimes the songs gravitate towards you for whatever reasons and these yeah. two, the moment i was listening to the album outside of the singles these really spoke to me. And the first one is Vengeance is Clear. It has okay. such a great guitar sound. The duality of melody and heaviness. I could hear on one side an incredible melody. And on the other side, I could hear this crunchiness of heaviness from the guitars. And my headphones, I was just, my mind was trying to process these two sounds coming at me at the same time. So I absolutely love what you guys did with the guitars on that track. Can you give us a little bit of behind the scenes on Vengeance is Clear? Uh, of course I can. Yeah, that, that one's a favorite of mine as well. Um, I, I wrote the music of that with Austin, our drummer. Um, he's, he's a wonderful guitar player. He's, he's not like technique wise, he's not your best go to guy. Like he doesn't have a lot of recording technique. But as far as ideas, you want him around for sure. Like he can come up with some great ideas that um, the main riff, the first thing you hear on that, it's, it's drummy. And it's because Austin wrote that part. Um, uh, it's it's just I think it's a perfect example of at least musically that's of me and Austin working 
working out parts and getting it done together. Um, and I tried to keep, whenever we, we did the final touches and everything, um, I tried to keep his raw rhythmistic approach to it. But then it, I feel like that gave me more room to do melodical things because it's, it's, it's one of the most tribal, tribally sounding songs we have on the, on the whole record. And that lends itself to, to, to giving a lot of room for melody. And I tried to, I tried to fill that space as, as, as smartly as I could, you know. Oh, I think you nailed it. I, it's, it's like it's I said, one of my favorite tracks. Absolutely. I love the, the guitar sound on it. It's just exquisite. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it, it, we definitely paid attention to every detail when doing that. I, I can't remember the specific, I guess I got an email somewhere where I wrote down every amp we did, but, uh, I mean, that, that, another thing about that song is it's in drop A, we recorded on baritones. So you're already in a sonically different area than a guitar. It, uh, right off the bat, the first thing you hear, two baritones screaming at you. Um, and I think that, that's what sets it apart as well. Another one of my favorite tracks is Wishing. I, I love the solo on that song. I love the overall sound that the track has, but the solo is really like, every time that I listened to that song, I was always waiting for it. Okay, it, it, it's, it's kind of like Christmas. I, I know it's coming, I just have to <laughs> yeah. wait for it. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on that track? Yeah, I mean, that's another one that I wrote um, all the music for, and that's me soloing it. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, tried, I was like, trying not to make it seem like it was such a mountain climb right to the solo the whole time. But... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, it just felt like it was gradually getting there. I just, I couldn't wait to get there, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's then it worked also. Um, I, I, I didn't want to take away, you know, it's a, it's very, the verses are really uh, simplistic. There's not, there's not much going on on the guitars. You're going to, if you're a guitar player, you can figure it out pretty quick. Um, we tried to add like, that, that was one of Steve's ideas to add the key change for the solo. We, I think it went up, up a whole step for it. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, solo wise, um, I, I, on that one, I was specifically trying to channel as best I could two of my favorite guitar players. We're talking about um, Dimebag and then Ian Thornley from Big Wreck. And I was just trying to think of, you know, if, if there's any kind of licks like them that I can play, let's try to put them in this. Um, and, you know, keep sounding like myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was a fun one. I remember writing that and it, it, it felt like what you just said, like the whole time I was kind of waiting to get to the solo, like, what are we going to do on this solo? Let's get, let's get to it. <laughs> yeah, from, from, from a fan's perspective, like I'm listening to this, I mean, after I listened to it the first time, obviously, I know when it's coming, but every time yeah. that I listen to the song now, because I know it's there, I'm just kind of like, you know, in anticipation, not that, I, not that I'm skipping through the rest of the song, but I know that it's like, it feels like there's a buildup to it that just makes it even better. When it finally arrives, you're like, ah, it's here and now I can enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like it just has that great buildup to it. I, just magnificent track all around. Yeah, great to hear. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that was the intent. So now with the album out or coming out on October 2nd on Napalm Records and considering the world that we're living in, how do you guys promote this album? How do you plan for a promotion cycle with no tours, no shows, nothing? <laughs> Uh, that's that's a great question you give us any ideas you got yourself um <laughs> we we're, we're figuring it out just like any other band man um i i think that we're going to try to do some stream some live streaming type of thing um you know we're trying to be on our socials as much as we can a, a little more so than we used to be like when we would be on the road it's really tough it's hard like um i i have really really bad asthma like special inhalers every day i've been to the hospital because of it um so i i can't mess around you know like i can't just go out and see well maybe it'll be safe today like i can't do that um so it really puts us in a corner of like what what do we do um the the biggest the biggest thing that we're trying to do is just talk word of mouth you know of social media talk to our friends even even the you know the ones that don't care that i'm in a band or anything like hey man why don't you tell your kids why don't you tell your grandparents whatever tell them about my band this, this record's <laughs> yeah. coming out. um we're trying a little bit of everything i mean um most of us also aren't like the biggest social social butterflies like we don't a lot of us don't really want to be on like set up a, a night where like, hey man, come hang out with us and we'll talk the record. Like it's not the most comfortable thing for most of us. So we're kind of have to step out of the comfort zone, you know? 
Yeah, I hear you. I, I hear you. I, I've, I've been telling everybody that, that on our channel, whenever we do a review of an album or a song, uh, I'm really pushing for, for people to go out there and support the bands, pick up a vinyl, pick up a CD, buy a t-shirt, a bundle, whatever the case might be. First of yeah. all, we don't, we don't know when we're going to see you guys live. Uh, when, yeah. When's the next time I'm going to see you live? And there's just this whole infrastructure uh, that, that surrounds you that's part of who you guys are that's suffering right now, like mentally surf suffering because you're stuck in this situation and financially as well. So we have to support the bands if we want the bands to continue to put out music that helps yeah. us go through this hard period of time. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and I mean, the direct best ways are the ways that you're, you're encouraging people. Um, and that's to buy these bundles, you know. If you see the one that has like the extra shirt in it, go for it. It really helps having that extra $10 on the bundle. Or, you know, it also helps just seeing those streaming numbers or sales being a little higher than the last record because we're not doing anything else to make money, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough times. And whatever fans and, and people can do to support the bands is important because, you know, it, it's just, it's like a whole ecosystem that's right now at risk. And we're all part of yeah. it. So I think we yeah. all need to kind of just help the bands that we love make it through this tough time. Because like I said, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. I listen to your music during this time. It helps me exercise my demons. So I, I think it's only fair that we repay you guys with, with some love and picking up some merch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I, I hope most people think that way. I, I appreciate you. I have one last question for you. And that is overall, the album comes out in a couple of weeks. What are your expectations for this record? Man, um, I don't know that I have many expectations. The way that I, I look at records, um, I look at them as like, this is a time in my life where I tried my best to put out the best music I could for, for whatever reason, you know? And I think all my expectations have already really been met. I, we have a great record um, and no one's gonna tell me otherwise. Like, I, I love it. And that, that, that's huge for me. Like, there, sometimes there are records where I'm like, yeah, I don't know about most of this, but I love this record, the double record from, from front to back. Um, and I got to make it with my friends and have fun, man. Those, those were my hopes for it and I got them. And that's all, I, that's all that really matters to me. Besides that, I hope that it sells a lot. I hope <laughs> that we have big enough numbers to where whenever we do finally get back on the road, which make no mistake, it will happen, that we can play places uh, even farther away, bigger, greater things i mean that's my my ultimate thing is playing guitar live for people and i can't wait to get back to it and i hope that this record facilitates it um sooner than later and in, in a great way yeah i hope to see you guys live here in toronto sometime soon the last tour you guys did was us only with ginger and uh, i uh there was no toronto dates but i hope why did we not we do great in toronto i love toronto yeah and it's kind of like in the way of going somewhere else i guess <laughs> you know what i mean if you're, <laughs> yeah. coming, if you're coming from cleveland i guess and passing through buffalo why not just do a little bit of a two-hour drive up north to the great city of toronto i say exactly and, exactly and I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that <laughs> yeah I'll, next time you guys come to town i'll have some donuts for you and uh, i'll definitely pick up some merch at the merch stand so so uh show some support for you guys this is a great album congratulations on, on the record thank you so much i appreciate that man Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for taking the time. Of course. Take care. All right. Bye.